So to start out, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Marie Edison, who is going to take us through some SBOs on bowel obstruction. Hi guys, thank you for tuning in. Um, for those of you who haven't been to a QuesMed session before, um, the way it works is we go through a question and then we'll do some teaching around that. Um, so without further ado, the first single best answer question we have is a 72 year old lady who's presented to you with a two day history of profuse vomiting and colicky abdominal pain. Today it became feculent and she's not been able to pass stool or flatus. Her past medical history includes high blood pressure, three caesarean sections and a left salpingectomy for an ectopic pregnancy. She's on herbisartin but no other medications and on examination her heart rate's going a little bit but she doesn't have a temperature. You do think that she looks on balance um, a little bit dry and that her abdomen is distended and it does have hyperactive tinkling bowel sounds. What is the most likely diagnosis? Ten seconds. Okay, good. So the majority of you have it right. Uh, the answer is a small bowel obstruction. So um, the reason why this is a small bowel obstruction um, is because usually this presents with the vomiting before the absolute constipation. So absolute constipation means inability to pass both stool and flatus. Um, whereas if you have a presentation that's more uh, that they couldn't pass any wind and then maybe this morning they started vomiting, that's when you should start thinking more about a large bowel obstruction. Um, also, what makes small bowel obstruction um, your more likely diagnosis is that she has risk factors for it. So adhesions are the most common cause of a small bowel obstruction, and this lady has had multiple previous abdominal surgeries. Always in women, ask about caesareans and gynae history because you'd be amazed how many don't really consider it an operation and won't mention it when you say any past medical history or any surgeries. But obviously a caesarean section, if you've ever witnessed one, is pretty major abdominal surgery and there will definitely uh, be some adhesions from that. Um, so the, to run through why the other answers are incorrect, large bowel obstruction. So we talked about that for large bowel obstruction, typically your history is more in keeping with the constipation coming first or bloating, and then you have the vomiting. Um, also, the fact that this lady has had multiple abdominal surgeries leads adhesions of more likely risk, which wouldn't cause a large bowel obstruction. Um, paralytic ileus. So when you have an obstruction, the one way to classify it is into mechanical or paralytic. So mechanical is a physical blockage. Uh, so that uh, would be something like a fecal impaction. Or paralytic, though, means that you've disrupted the normal peristaltic activity of the bowel. So although the presentation is quite similar to a me mechanical bowel obstruction in terms of what the patient will tell you, as there's a lack of that intestinal movement because you um, have disrupted the autonomic uh, supply to it, you will have classically silent bowel sounds. And here it's described tinkling ones. Also in general, usually your pain is more generalized with a paralytic ileus. Um, there's, there's not sort of um, really severe colicky pain. And the common causes of a paralytic ileus uh, are not described here. So usually uh, they include drugs um, that have a noise in like opiates um, or anticholinergic agents or anti-Parkinsonian drugs. Um, and typically, it's a, it can be a post-operative complication if you've had one that involves a lot of bowel handling. So there's no risk factors for this one. A pseudo-obstruction. So this is a particular form of paralytic ileus. So it's basically you have all the symptoms of it, but there is nothing on your imaging. So there's no evidence um, when you do a scan or, or x-ray or things like that. So sometimes this is secondary to electrolyte imbalances. 
uh, so maybe in a metabolic disorder or something, or sometimes it's due to a fracture of the spine or to ischemia to the gut, uh, and that's what's disrupted your um, autonomic supply. Labyrinthitis. So always remember, even if you are the surgical SHO, F1, medicine being referred something from A&E, you have to put your own diagnostic hat on. So what you have as a lady with um, severe vomiting, you need to think, is this definitely, although it sounds like it's bowel obstruction, you need to just have play a little bit of thought to have they considered the other differentials. Could this be a medical differential? Um, you know, it's not the case here, but a gynae differential, something like that. So labyrinthitis can give you very bad vomiting, um, but you would then expect ataxia or vertigo um, and obviously it wouldn't explain the feculent vomit here. Um, just as a note when people uh, have this sort of presentation because they probably vomited a lot of fluid they'll also say they're dizzy but if you're trying to distinguish that from something like labyrinthitis when someone says dizzy to me I always make them clarify do you mean you're lightheaded or do you mean that the, something is spinning and then you can go further into whether or not they're spinning or the world's spinning around them but we won't go there. Um, so if you were trying to find a way to structure your differentials, the word vitamin can be used as a good sieve. Um, so in terms of the letters, uh, you have vascular, infective, toxins, autonome, uh, autoimmune, metabolic, inflammatory and neurological. And just to chuck out a few examples, um, medical causes of nausea or diarrhea and vomiting, um, think about chemo or radiotherapy, gastroenteritis, alcohol abuse, withdrawal syndromes, um, laxative abuse, or neurological, you know, increased intracranial pressure, migraine, pain, pregnancy, etc. Um, okay, so moving on to the next question. We have a 77-year-old man this time. He's presented to you with colicky abdominal, abdominal pain and inability to pass stool aflatus. He's vomited once this morning. He smokes 20 cigarettes a day and his past medical history is of a heart attack two years ago. He's lost two stone in weight, but he put this down um, to trying to eat better after his heart attack. His doctors had told him off and he thought he'd done a really good job. His blood show you a micro anemia and an x-ray confirms a large bowel obstruction. What is the most likely cause of this? Ten seconds. Good. Okay. So again, um, you guys are well on it. <laughs> so in terms of causes of bowel obstruction, and um, we'll sum up in a second, um, but this presentation is what we talked about more in keeping with a large bowel obstruction. So I gave you the diagnosis there. Um, and up to 60% of large bowel obstructions are secondary to a malignancy, and it might well be their first presentation. I had uh, something like three patients in two weeks that presented with their, they didn't know they had a colorectal cancer with large bile obstruction uh, on one set of on calls. Um, so in terms of his risk factors, he is a smoker and we know that's not good. Um, and it would also explain his systemic features of the weight loss. So uh, a gentleman this age, to be honest, with, without being too rude, even if you put yourself on a diet, once you hit a certain age, it's quite difficult to lose a substantial amount of weight. But the patient obviously will have other comorbidities that may also predispose towards this cancer that's occurred, um, and they may not have uh, realized this. Um, so it's important just to think again outside the box when someone says this. His bloods also show a microcytic anemia. So that implies to you immediately this must be something that's chronic, because even if he was having a very severe abdominal bleed, you'd have a normocytic, normochromic um, picture on your bloods. If it's microcytic, the body has, must have had time to, um, had to compensate or to see these changes. Um, so diverticulitis, 
this is a common cause of large bowel obstruction. It's about 20%, so it's the second most common cause. And um, again, so this, this is a reasonable alternative, but um, it, doesn't, it wouldn't fit with his weight loss picture and with the other systemic features. You'd also in diverticulitis, I'd expect to see a past medical history um, of previous diverticular disease, because if it's caused an obstruction, what's probably happened is from recurrent diverticulitis episodes, you've ended up with a stricture and that's what's given you um, your obstruction. Um, and also he doesn't have your nice textbook symptoms of a, a left iliac ulcer pain and bloody diarrhea or a fever or things like that that would go in keeping with it. So sequel volvulus. So the next 5% of large bowel obstructions are caused by volvu uh, volvulus. 75% uh, are actually sigmoid. Uh, so the sequel is the less common one to have a bit. Um, and a volvulus is where a loop of bowel twists on its mesenteric axis. Um, so peritonitis can develop with this because what's also in that mesentery that's twisted is mesenteric vessels. So you could well end up with a bowel necrosis and gangrene. Um, and uh, in particular, sigmoid volvulus is four times more common in men uh, compared to women. Um, and in the elderly, particularly if he's slim, like it's implying this gentleman is, be on the lookout. Sometimes you can actually see asymmetric uh, distension when you examine their tummy. Uh, so for a sequel volvulus, you'd expect dilation in the right iliac fossa. And um, again, this doesn't explain your systemic features as we've described before. Strangulated hernia. So hernias, um, just to explain the difference between incarcerated and strangulated, because I think that's sometimes a little bit confusing. Incarcerate, a reducible one is one that can pop in and pop back out and we don't worry about what can happen sometimes though is that they pop out and then you can't push them back in and at that point it's an incarcerated hernia if you cannot reduce it. Now that's an emergency but it's not as much of an emergency as a strangulated one because that is when you have an incarcerated hernia that's now also got a compromised blood supply. So you've got a risk of bowel necrosis. However, in either case, hernias usually cause a small bowel obstruction, which is not the case here. Similarly, for adhesions, uh, you would expect a small bowel obstruction, and neither of these two would explain the weight loss and anemia. So to summarize, the most common causes of bowel obstruction, we've talked through large bowel, 60% malignancy, 20% diverticular disease, and 5% volvuli. Please don't tell me that doesn't add up. It's because the other lot are all the weird and wonderful stuff. And uh, I'm just gonna tell you the three ones that are pretty key. Um, small bowel, it, the order would be adhesions, hernias, and then inflammatory bowel disease. So for example, if you have Crohn's and then a stricture. <clears throat> so, to think about causes of bowel obstruction, um, if you've watched any other talks, I mean, I always plug structure because when you first start out learning stuff in medicine, typically people learn a lot of lists and lists are quite hard to remember and they get even harder to remember when you're on night shift number four and just can't really think all that straight. But if you have a structure, it means you won't miss stuff and you'll think of the safe stuff and that's what makes you um, a safe doctor, which is really what even at a finals level, you know, the, the minutiae of different managements is not so much people's worry. They just want to know, will you be a safe F1? So find your OH structure. If you've now, if you've written out a list of causes of things, go, go back, have a look at the list and work out if there's a way you like to structure it. I will talk through in a minute the way I like to think about bowel obstruction, but if it's not your way, I don't mind at all. This is just one example. So you could either do this perhaps by sight, so small causes of small versus large bowel. You could do it by the speed of onset, so acute versus chronic versus acute on chronic. You could do it by the nature, whether they're simple or complicated. Um, and the impact on the patient, perhaps, is it a partial or a complete obstruction? For me personally, I find the simplest way to think about causes of bowel obstruction is outside the wall, within the wall, within the lumen. And then I find it so much easier if I just think of three or four at each of those, suddenly I have um, a, you know, double figures of differentials to give one of my bosses if he's asked me. So outside the wall, your adhesions, your hernias, volvuli we've talked about, but then also do think about, um, you know, this might not be a colorectal cancer, is it an ovarian cancer that's pushing in on the bowel? External cancers can compress stuff. Um, you know, a head of pancreas mass that's ended up compressing your duodenum, things like that. And then there's some congenital causes. 
Within the wall, I further subdivide this in my head into infective and into inflammatory. So infective, things like diverticulitis, and inflammatory are your IBD strictures, things like this. Paralytic ileus we've talked about is disrupting um, the autonomic uh, nervous system within the gut wall. So this is also within the wall. The drugs that typically cause this also act on the gut wall. Um, your primary colon cancer will be arising from the wall, or you can have a metastatic cancer in the wall. So I think, and it can be something that happened ages ago. So I think even um, two to 5% of melanomas present as uh, small bowel mets. Now I'm not saying remember that one cause, it's just because I had a, a patient with that case the other week, but um, until you biopsy, you don't actually technically really know where that cancer's come from. And your biopsy, the cells on that, typically the METs show the same cells as the primary. So if you biopsied a lesion and it came back with pigmented cells, that's what would make you think, are oh, the primary is a melanoma, which they may have had cut out 10 years ago for all you know. Um, and then within the lumen, so impacted feces is a really, really common cause on the elderly. Please, when you're discharging patients, if they're elderly and they're going home on cocodamol or something like this, give them some laxatives to take along with it. Because even if you tell them, oh, it can cause constipation if that happens, go out and get some. If they go home with some lactulose, they're more likely to take it really than if they go out. I know some hospitals have policies that don't like prescribing it, but I think it's quite a common one that probably, particularly in surgical teams, we're not aware of just how frequently it's happening. I've spent a lot of time in A&E, and what happens is they'll come in, you'll do your PR, rather than an empty rectum, you're going to get completely hard stool. You put in some suppositories, they have a night in typically something called like a CDU or like a 24 hour ward and they go home. I'm not sure that the sort of inpatient teams ever really know about it. So just think about it, like small things matter and they matter to your patient. Um, foreign body, people put stuff up their bottom. I will say no more about that. Um, parasites, worms, things like that. Um, and a gallstone ileus. Just to clarify, it's a really unhelpful misnomer. So a gallstone ileus is where a gallstone has eroded through into your gut. It travels along until it blocks it. And usually the point at which it blocks it is your ileocecal valve because it narrows there. It is a mechanical obstruction. If we're dividing these things again into mechanical and paralytic, it, um, despite the fact it says ileus in the title, is a mechanical obstruction. The gallstone has blocked the lumen and things have backed up. Um, so just well, watch out for that one. I think it can cause some confusion because of the naming. So moving on to our next SBA, um, we now have a 59 year old lady who's presented with abdominal pain. It's worse in the left iliac fossa and she has absolute constipation. Her past medical history includes some high blood pressure, diabetes and recurrent diverticular disease. She takes losartan, metformin, estrogen patches, and monthly, for, you, for those of you that don't know that brand name, it's a progesterone, basically, as a um, HRT therapy. Imaging confirms a large bowel obstruction, um, and she undergoes an emergency Hartman's procedure. What is the most underlying, likely underlying cause of her obstruction? Ten seconds. Okay, great. Um, doing really well. Okay, so diverticular stricture. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of things in there, but it's also to contain lots of teaching around it. So we've talked about it's a very common cause of large bowel obstruction, and she has that sort of ding, ding, ding history of recurrent diverticular disease that would be a risk factor of having a stricture. Um, the history of the pain is in keeping with the left iliac fossa. Slight addendum. Be wary the second someone says left iliac fossa, make sure it probably isn't, but just make sure you have a little think in your head that you have ruled out or it, it isn't a, a triple A or something vascular. Um, because although the textbooks say a triple A rupture is central and radiating through to the back, 
actually quite a few can present with left iliac fossa or right iliac fossa pain. So if they're hemodynamically unstable and they look really unwell and it was sudden onset. So when someone says they've had bloody diarrhea or something recently, just ask a quick question. Is it one sudden evacuation of your bowels that had some blood in it at like 2 a.m. in the morning that you had to get up for? Or is it, yes, over the past few days, few weeks, whatever, increasing frequency and increasing blood? Because the latter is clearly more diverticular disease. If you have a mesenteric infarction, um, then you can get a singular, usually quite sudden, um, bloody diarrheal episode. So just, just watch out. Anything that says sudden onset, I, you need to have a think about vascular before you think about other things, even if it's been referred to you as a diverticulitis. Um, but yeah, moving away from this, this was the correct um, answer. Uh, so also the thing that would point towards this is we'll come on to talk about some of the managements later on, but a Hartman's procedure, which for those of you that don't know, is a sigmoid colectomy with an end colostomy. It can be reversed at a later date. The reality is only about a third of people actually do have it reversed in the end, but it's nice to leave that option. The reason why it's low is either people are elderly and they sort of have learned to live with it and decide they don't want another procedure or due to surgical factors it's not actually possible. Um, so moving on then, uh, a terminal ileal stricture. So if she'd had a history of Crohn's disease, definitely this is one to think about. Um, Crohn's typically affects your terminal ileum and it can well lead to a stricture there. Uh, moreover, the, that would cause a small bowel obstruction, not a large bowel obstruction. And a Hartman's procedure would be would not resolve the problem because you've taken out the wrong bit of bowel if you've taken out the sigmoid. Um, so it would be the wrong treatment that she's had for it. Uh, if you do have a terminal ileal stricture, usually you do need a small bowel resection. Ideally in Crohn's patients, we try and avoid it if possible because they can get short gut syndrome. Um, but if the ileocecal valve is compromised in that stricture, then you also might need to do a right hemicolectomy. Um, so an incarcerated femoral hernia, um, so again, hernia as we've talked about, more likely to cause a small bowel obstruction. Um, also more common in a slightly older demographic than this, but not impossible. Um, and uh, the Hartman's procedure would not have fixed the problem. Ovarian cancer. So we talked about in the causes that you've got to think about cancers that can push in from elsewhere. So definitely something to think about in a 59 year old. However, with her HRT, if she had unopposed estrogen, that is a risk factor for cancer. But two things here, one, she's not, she is having a monthly progesterone alongside it, so that should mitigate that risk. And secondly, it would cause endometrial hyperplasia, not ovarian. Um, so that just, again, doesn't quite fit. And a mesenteric emboli. So I've sort of started to talk about this a little bit earlier. This is when you have, in the same way you can throw off a clot to your brain and have a stroke or to a coronary artery and, and have a heart attack, you can throw one off to the vessels to your gut and infarct a segment of bowel. Um, so there is when you would expect that more singular bloody diarrheal episode. And what, the reason why it happens is because as the bit of bowel wall dies or stuff, it can leak a bit of blood down into that urine. Um, and the irritation, you get this sudden evacuation. Um, sometimes it'll, you know, if it was a, overnight, it might have woken them up to sleep to go, which people don't usually poo overnight. That's a bit of a flag in your head, um, unless you are an IBD patient, and then it's more common. Um, if you do have a mesenteric emboli, this is treated with an immediate laparotomy um, and resection of the infarcted segments. Sometimes you also leave it and you do a second relook laparotomy the next day because ideally you want to leave as much bowel as you can. But if there were bits that you weren't quite sure about, that's why you go in and have another look and just check if they're still healthy or do you need to resect a bit more. Um, okay, so this slide was slightly about risk factors. Um, so the risk factors for obstruction are going to be um, the risk factors for the diseases that cause them. So uh, if you were thinking meconium ileus in a child, then cystic fibrosis is your risk factor. If you have recurrent diverticular disease, that's your risk factor for stricture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other way that you can slightly stratify where to start thinking in your deferentials is pay attention to the age of the patient, because it can be a bit of a clue to the cause. So in the neonatal period, 
I would be thinking more about things like congenital atresia, stenosis, an imperforate anus, volvulus neonatorium, Hirschsprung's disease, meconium ileus. These are things that present very quickly. In infants, it would be intersusception, Hirschsprung's can occur, uh, a meckel diverticulum is the other thing. And we, uh, there is a pediatric slide later, so I'm sort of skimming over those ones. Young adults to middle age, this is when I more think about hernias, IBD, adhesions, if remembering again to ask about C-section histories in women. And in the elderly, again, hernias, particularly um, femoral hernias and elderly women. Uh, colon cancer, and another, any cancer really, um, diverticulitis and impaction. Um, taking a strong drugs history is important for, first of all, stratifying whether you think this is like a paralytic alias versus a mechanical obstruction, but then also as your um, risk factors for impaction if they're more elderly. So our next case is a 73 year old lady She's presented with abdominal pain and distension. Uh, she is from a nursing home and has severe, severe dementia, so she can't really give you much of a history. Um, but she does seem really agitated. So in elderly people, I mean, it's very common. Sometimes they can't give you a great history. And although even if they sometimes come with someone or a care or something, they, they typically don't know what happened or don't really, aren't always a, a mine of information, but you should check because sometimes they are and they're great. Um, so, but watch how they are. If, if they look quite agitated, ask, is this their normal level of agitation? Because it can be a sign of pain. Um, and dementia nurses will love it if you prescribe regular paracetamol to demented people who are a bit more agitated on the ward because it can often settle them down. And obviously if you put it on the PRN side, they're not really going to ask for it. Uh, so she's vomiting profusely and she's complaining of a strange tingling down the medial aspect of her left thigh. Uh, on examination, her vital obs are stable, she's afebrile, but her abdomen is generally tender, there's no specific point, and a rectal exam reveals an empty rectum, but there is a small, smooth, tender mass that's just superior to the less ischium. What is the most likely diagnosis? Ten seconds. Okay, so I was a little bit mean with this one. I put in some of the rarer ones because I'm expecting that you're probably quite comfortable with some of the more common ones. So let's go through it. So the correct answer was an obturator hernia which a lot of you may not have heard of before, um, but remember, it's great if, if people have hernias on the outside, they're typically a lot easier to spot, but you can get internal hernias. Um, and one of these is an obturator hernia where you have the bowel that's got stuck in the obturator foramen. They have about a 40% mortality rate, and a lot of this can be attributed to a delay in making that diagnosis. So that's why it's, uh, I put it in there just as something, um, yes, a little bit rarer, but something to have in the back of your mind. Um, so the reason why it's an obturator hernia, you've got your history of a small bowel obstruction, so that would fit with a hernia. And the mass in her rectum is tender. It's smooth, it doesn't sound like it's a cancer, but also a cancer wouldn't really be tender. Um, and the, also the other clue in this was the strange tingling down the medial aspect of her left thigh, which is exactly the area the obturator nerve supplies sens uh, your sensation to. If it's compressed within the hernia or something like, or because the hernia is pushing on it as it goes through the foramen, you can become symptomatic with it. So sometimes people have odd little pains that I agree aren't in anatomical locations, but sometimes they can be a real clue. Listen to your patient. Um, it also, if it was a, a colorectal cancer, which is one other, other option, you would expect the symptoms of a large bowel obstruction and the, an irregular mass on a rectum thing that would also not explain the paresthesia she's having down that medial aspect of her thigh. So a femoral hernia. 
common cause of small bowel obstruction in an old lady. Um, and whilst this can well present with a small bowel obstruction, it wouldn't explain the tingling that you've got down her thigh. Uh, and also the classic description of this hernia is a mass that's below and lateral to the pubic tubercle. And it's also medial to the femoral pulse, not the rectal mass. So it just doesn't quite fit with this picture. Um, Aletus hernia. So Aletus hernia is when you have a Meckel's diverticulum uh, which for, uh, we will come on to talk about it later, but it's basically an outpouching of all three layers of the gut wall. It can look a bit like a thumb and have some um, ectopic gastric tissue in it. So this is when you have a Meckel's within your hernial sac. Uh, the most common sites for this are inguinal, femoral or umbilical um, anatomically. And you may get some GI bleeding with this because, like I said, that diverticulum can contain some ectopic gastric tissue and if this may bleed. Um, so again, uh, whilst it's not unreasonable because a strangulated um, inguinal femoral or umbilical hernia can present as a small bowel obstruction, these locations wouldn't explain the paresthesia down her thigh and they wouldn't have a rectal mass. Uh, so a colorectal cancer, we, we've already sort of talked about, and also you would be wanting to look for systemic features like weight loss or anemia. A sigmoid volvulus, um, it, it would cause a, a large bowel obstruction, um, but uh, a volvulus um, where it twists on the mesenteric axis, it's only the case for about 5% of these, so it's, it's not as common. Um, and for an elderly person, we've talked about some as you can see asymmetrical distension. It's not, not always the case, um, but for sigmoid volvulus, this would be initially in the left lower quadrant, um, and it would be maybe more tender over that area than the rest of the abdomen. Again, it wouldn't explain um, the thigh symptoms um, and all the rectal mass. So just coming into types of hernia, common ones, um, just to whip through where they are, so uh, umbilical, fairly obvious where that comes through. Para-umbilical is, is just adjacent to that. Epigastric, or, or sometimes called ventral, um, is, a, is superior to your umbilicus um, and on your linear alba. Uh, femoral um, is uh, below and lateral to the pubic tubercle. Um, inguinal can be direct or indirect, so direct is through something called Hasselbach's triangle typically, and indirect um, is going uh, down through that inguinal canal. So if in a, uh, sometimes you can't tell with these which one it is until you come to repair it, but if it's a very large one and it's gone down into the scrotum, you can pretty much say this is a, an indirect inguinal hernia uh, in the case of a man, and an incisional hernia. Um, Rarer ones, so the ones that I sort of put in here, obturator, we've talked about, and like I say, can have a very, very high uh, mortality rate, someone to think about. A spigalian hern um, hernia is one that's in your lini semilunaris. Um, the letus hernia, like we talked about, contains a meckles. About 50% are inguinal, 20% are femoral, and 20% are umbilical in terms of your distribution. Um, and a writer's hernia, this is when the anti-mesenteric border of small bowel is in the hernia. So if you have your mesentery, you have your bowel, it's this border and it gets pinched just like a sort of pouch of it. It's not like the full thing is through. The ones that are most likely to strangulate in order, so the ones that tend to be repaired the fastest if you're in uh, a reducible outpatient setting, are femoral, indirect inguinal, umbilical, and then para-umbilical. Uh, um, the other rare ones to think about are epigastric spaghetti and an obturator that need sort of almost immediate repair. Um, incisional depends where it is. Um, sometimes they don't always need any repair if they've got like a very wide neck. So it sort of depends on, on how small the neck is versus how big what's come out of it. Um, and sometimes that if it's built up over a long period of time or if the patient's very overweight, you may well need to, if they've got a very narrow neck, they just gradually over time more and more sort of, it might not even be bowel fat has just pouched down into it and now it's going somewhat necrotic. So our next case, uh, we now have a young female, she's 27, and she's presented with profuse vomiting, abdominal distension, and abdominal pain. She has a past medical history of severe Crohn's disease since early adolescence, and she's already had two small uh, two bowel resections for strictures. She's on monthly infliximab infusion, so that just tells you it's severe. That's quite a high-grade treatment. Um, and on examination, her abdomen is tense with tinkling hyperactive bowel sounds. What is the best initial diagnostic investigation for this lady? 
10 seconds. Good, so the majority of you have it right. Um, so the best investigation, the key bit here is the wording. So rarely in questions is anything not deliberate. Um, so take a highlighter in with you to the exam or whatever, and in each sentence, find what they're trying to tell you. So plain films are simple and easy and quick to get. So it's why they're good initial diagnostic investigations. Additionally, this is a young lady. She's of a childbearing age and she's got a disease that means she may well end up with multiple imaging, including CTs of her abdomen. So if you can make this diagnosis um, or even rule it out with something simpler, you can save her a radiation dose as well, which would also be good um, considering that if she, you know, in terms of coming to have children and things like that in the future. They're also just very practical. Um, so if the patient is unable to sit upright for an erect chest x-ray, you can do um, a supine uh, abdominal film um, or a left lateral um, uh, decubitive position instead to try and help with that if they're very cri uh, critically unwell. Uh, this can help triage those who need immediate intervention, i.e. if there's a perforation or compromise. So if you're seeing someone, try and think critical, non-critical. So critical is bleeding, infarction or perforation, which if you saw free air under on an erect chest x-ray, you'd have your diagnosis immediately. And that's by that, I mean, that's the one that you need to start doing A to E and working up for surgery, not doing a beautiful clerking and referring on somewhere else. Um, everything else, you have a bit more time. Uh, an erect chest x-ray is about 70% sensitive for free air underneath it, um, but bearing in mind the timings, because um, if it hasn't had long enough to build up lots of air to sit neatly for you under that diaphragm, it may not be the case. So I, I have a gentleman with a perforated duodenal ulcer and the pain had been sudden onset, but about an hour ago and all of his imaging, apart from the CT, was normal. Um, so in terms of the signs that we talk about free air or a psoas sign, um, it can indicate there's uh, free air in the abdomen or retroperitoneum, which is where the psoas gets, uh, you can see it too clearly. Um, and if you have an obstructed, uh, dilated bowel, you may get this, it's described as a laddering appearance where you see fluid levels. Um, so CT abdomen with contrast. A very good investigation. I saw a bunch of you put that. Almost certainly a lot would, might end up proceeding to a CT, but it's asked for the initial best diagnosis um, investigation. Um, so if there are no signs of bowel compromise, then you can send that patient for a CT if you need further information. If someone is unstable, you can't put them through a CT scanner or you shouldn't, um, because if something happens to them, they're obviously not easy to access. Um, so a CT with contrast is indeed sensitive and specific, and you do need contrast um, to see the outline of uh, the bowel wall clearly. Um, so this is one where I know sometimes it gets a bit confusing between when you want contrast and when you don't. This is one you do. Um, so this CT can particularly help with information on the site. Uh, you may see, it can tell you a transition point, the cause of the obstruction, and can help uh, work people up for surgery in terms of planning. Signs that you can see in this are air in the bowel wall, um, so pneumat uh, pneumatosis <laughs> intestinalis, sorry, it's been a long day, um, ascites, uh, if there's like inflammatory fluid in there, uh, or in the case of a closed loop obstruction, you get a, a CT whirl sign. So uh, uh, that is where um, you end up with uh, decompressed loops of bowels that are all twisted around axis. So, um, typically on a volvuli. So what you have is the center where it's twisted and then all these decompressed loops around it and it looks like a well. Um, you, can, you can see good images of things like this. We will come on to talk about it a bit later um, on things like Radiopedia. Other websites are available. Um, there just wasn't one that was uh, available in the public domain for me to put up here. Um, please also know patients may well have other things going on. So if she's got bowel obstruction and she's um, really dehydrated, give a thought to whether or not you've got a renal injury, because if you've got an AKI above a certain point, you need to think about this before you give contrast. You need to give some fluid resuscitation before it. Can we actually not do it full stop, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so laboratory investigations. 
The question answer the best initial diagnostic investigation, so the key bit there is the diagnostic word. Lab investigation is going to be very, very helpful for you. Um, there can be huge electrolyte imbalances in this sort of thing, um, but they're not going to be diagnostic. Um, a blood gas can show different pictures. So it can show a metabolic acidosis, which could indicate ischemia infarction. Um, uh, but please don't be fooled by normal lactate. So if the lactate is high, that is really good information. That's good to know because that's not a good sign at all. But if your patient looks unwell and is really tender or there's uh, dangerous things on that scan, just because the lactate's normal, treat the patient, not the numbers. Okay. Um, I've seen their bowel in a knot where the lactate was normal. It's, it's not the case all the time. It's just um, don't live and die by it, is I guess what I'm trying to say. MRI imaging. Um, so this is obviously very useful for looking at specific tissues in more detail. It's a great pay, uh, investigation if you are in an outpatient, say, IBD setting, or sometimes in children, uh, but obviously isn't appropriate in this acute setting. Um, contrast enema. It asks for the best initial investigation, so plain films are simpler than this and more rapid to obtain. Um, a contrast enema is sometimes used in acute pseudo-obstruction because it can be therapeutic in addition to being diagnostic. So talking through the investigations for bowel obstruction, again, try and think of a structure. I don't mind how you do it. So you're going to go in as your SHO, FY, whatever you are, do your A to E approach. And then I think of investigations as at the patient's bedside, bloods are a little bit away from the bedside, and then special imaging. So at the bedside, I can get an ECG, I can get an erect chest X-ray, ABG or VG, VBG, depending on, you know, if we want to do a differentials perhaps with pancreatitis, you might need an ABG to do that Glasgow school. Bloods wise, FBC, you can um, look for uh, raised inflammatory markers, um, check the hemoglobin, use and ease, you'll want to look particularly at uh, the potassium and also add on the magnesium. LFTs can help rule out your differentials, um, or perhaps in the case of a, a colonic cancer, there may be a liver met so that we could also add in useful information. And I'm laser calcium, again, just in terms of thinking about pancreatitis as a differential. Clotting and a group and save, if this person's going to go for surgery, you need them on the system. Also in clotting, if someone's uh, got a perforation, they're severely septic, they may actually have DIC or something like that. So that's the other reason why that's a useful one. In terms of your special imaging, we've talked about x-rays and if they're stable, they can have a CT. Other things to think about, your contrast enema, um, if they've got an allergy, maybe an abdominal ultrasound um, or an MRI if you're in an outpatient setting. So before we, I show you some films and we'll have a bit of a chat about them, just going through the anatomy. So the, I know you've probably all been taught, you need to look for whether the, the lines on the bowel are going all the way across or just partly across, because that's gonna tell you uh, which are haustra um, and which are your um, valvulae convenientes. So I would remember halfway a haustra, so HH. In terms of your, if you, you need to look at size. So we count it as descended if your small bowel is greater than nine or your large bowel greater than so an obstruction or a perforation. So we've uh, talked about the differences you can see um, halfway or how straight to kind of make you remember that. Um, remember, although we talk about a laddering appearance, if uh, you may see actually a gasless abdomen, if you're, the loops are completely filled up by fluid, um, you may have no air in the rectum if you've got a complete obstruction. Um, and then you're, you could also be looking for transition points. So by that, I mean, you've got a proximal dilatation and then a distal collapse and you can find that, you can try and find that point. Uh, the double wall sign is what you can see here. It's just, you can see the, because there's air on both sides of the walls, you see an outline of the bowel wall with a clarity that you just shouldn't see normally. Um, so here we can see fluid levels and distended bowel loops on the right hand side and on the left hand side, we can see regular sign. Uh, so now uh, Volvi coming onto that. So sigmoid or cecal. 75% uh, sigmoid, the rest um, sequel. You, the coffee bean sign is what's typically described for sigmoid, so that's the image on the left. Um, and typically, actually, you tend to lose that definition of the lines across um, in sigmoid. 
um, it, it tends to look slightly more empty. And uh, a sequel uh, sign, so that's the one on the right hand side, it can be more like a C or a U, you tend to see uh, the bowel lines um, a bit more clearly, but also you can see this thing called, we talked about the whirl sign where you have the collapse, but loops of bowel sort of whirling around a mesenteric twist point. The, there's also something in sequel volvulus called an embryo sign. Um, I think probably you have to give it a little bit of the benefit of doubt that it looks like an embryo, but essentially you have a very large dilated sequel pole, which is the head, and then you have like one or two further segments, which are a body and tail coming on from that. Um, again, uh, if you look up images of it, you can um, see for yourself whether or not you think it looks like an embryo. Um, so this is a summary slide for you on small and large um, obstruction. And uh, in terms of the presentation, the most common causes uh, where you tend to feel the pain, uh, the size guide uh, and things to look for on an x-ray. So um, moving on, we have a 68 year old gentleman. He's presented with abdominal tenderness, vomiting and an inability to pass stool inflators. He reports that he had altered bowel habits for the last three months and occasionally sees blood mixed in with the stool. He smokes 40 cigarettes a day and has a diet with very little fiber. And uh, a CT with contrast shows you that there is a malignancy in the ascending colon. What is the most appropriate management? Ten seconds. Okay, yeah, so the majority of you have it right. Um, so I'm not going to talk in too much depth about this slide. There is a, a whole nother QuesMed talk, um, I, I know because I gave it, on colorectal cancer where we discuss the management of sort of where is the cancer, what are we now going to do to manage it. But for the purposes of here in the context of bowel obstruction, if you've suddenly had this large bowel present and you have someone with, a, it is a primary uh, colon cancer they didn't know about, what can we do in this acute emergency setting? So if you have um, a right-sided colonic cancer, you can do a, a resection there and then. Uh, usually you can get away with a primary anastomosis. Um, so uh, you do a right hemicolectomy, or if there's involvement further around, you may need to do an extended uh, right hemicolectomy around for this uh, uh, splenic flexure. Um, the, in terms of order of uh, risk of an anastomotic leak, because that's what we're worried about and whether or not we do primary anastomoses in acute settings. The risk, the lower down, the worse it is. So rectum, really high risk. Uh, the left-hand side of the bowel, not great. Moving around to the right and small bowel, you can usually get away with. Um, so in this setting, despite the fact he hasn't had full staging, you can resect uh, that primary lesion. And then he will later need a CT um, or maybe even a PET. And it may say actually, yep, you got all of it and that's fine. Or he may then need something further doing. Um, but he can have that work up after the, the resection can be done in an acute setting. Palliative chemotherapy. Um, well, he has a large bowel obstruction um, and an impending perforation potentially which would cause fecal peritonitis and death. So it would be inappropriate not to resolve the acute presentation in a previously fit and well man. Even arguably, how, depending on just how sort of frail or um, towards the end of their life they are, if this is something that's going to kill you there and then you may well do something for someone who's um, palliative. Um, and if you catch this early colonic malignancy, you can have a really good prognosis um, and may well be curable if we treat him now rather than palliate him. Um, a loop colostomy. Um, so this is when the obstruction is due to a cancer that's below the uh, perineum. So um, 
rectal cancers uh, and uh, this is not the case here because it's safer in that setting because you're going to need a pelvic MRI and lots of other workup to work out what's invading and what's going on. It's better to defunction, cure, sort out the obstruction and then deal with the primary in a separate elective setting. A high anterior resection. So this is when the obstruction is due to a cancer of the distal sigmoid colon on the upper rectum, which is not the case here. Uh, the decision between a colostomy or a primary anastomosis um, would be an operating consultant decision, is the reality. Um, and then also you need to think about your patient. So all of these come with the addendum of if they're actually quite a well patient, maybe, or they've got a, they're a Crohn's patient, they've specifically requested they do not want a stoma, then you may try a primary anastomosis. If they are somebody who's been on ionotropes, your entire operation, they're very frail, they've got lots of risk factors, it, that is a very high risk of a leak and you uh, probably wouldn't risk it. But again, your, your operating consultant will take that decision. And finally, a colonic stent insertion. So this can be one of the treatment options when an obstruction is due to a left-sided colonic malignancy, which is not the case here, it's a right-sided one. Um, and other options for your left-sided cancers are a left hemicolectomy with either an end colostomy or a primary anastomosis, or perhaps a subtotal colectomy and anastomosis. Again, I'm not going to say much more on those ones. There's a whole different talk on it. So our next question. Uh, we have an 86-year-old lady. She has sudden onset abdominal pain and absolute constipation. Her abdomen is distended asymmetrically. It's worse in the right upper and lower quadrants. And palpation of this area is really tender compared to the rest of it. A VBG shows you a metabolic acidosis and a high lactate. And a CT shows you a cecal volvulus with a 13 centimeter cecal diameter. What is the most appropriate definitive treatment? Ten seconds. Okay. Um yeah, so again, uh, you, you guys are all along the right lines. So the correct answer is a laparotomy and aocecal resection. So this patient has a cecal volvuli greater than 12 centimeters and it's tender, which implies an impending perforation. The metabolic acidosis and high lactate also potentially imply bowel compromise. And the treatment for this, if the patient is well enough, is to do your emergency laparotomy and an aocecal resection, but you do not attempt a prior decompression which um, if the, it was a smaller one or uh, it was no impending perforation is what you may attempt to undertake. And that's with like a, a flatus tube or something. Um, as if you just try decompressing, you may miss necrotic bowel, which then later makes them go very, very sick. Uh, risk factors for cecal volvuli include congenital malformations, uh, being elderly, a nursing home resident and chronic constipation. So a laparotomy and Hartman's procedure. So that's a sigmoid colectomy with formation of an end colostomy. This is your treatment for acute diverticulitis um, or a benign diverticular stricture uh, that has been complicated by obstruction uh, and or has a, a perforation or a, a fecal peritonitis. Like I've said, it leaves the possibility to reverse in the future, or that isn't always done. And in that setting, a primary anastomosis is contraindicated, um, particularly in the presence of any peritoneal contamination, as there's a high complication rate, um, and you shouldn't attempt, uh, attempt a stenting procedure in this acute situation. Um, a left hemicolectomy and end colostomy. So this is one of the surgical treatment options when you have a left-sided um, colon cancer not the case here and also wouldn't resolve your problem. Um, and uh, like we talked about before, your other left-sided cancer options are left hemi with a primary anastomosis, a colonic stent insertion, or a subtotal colectomy and anastomosis. 
colonoscopy and decompression. This is uh, one of the treatments for acute pseudo obstruction, um, if, and that's if your conservative methods for pseudo obstruction have failed. So those typically start with correcting any metabolic abnormalities um, and um, if, if IV uh, neostigmine. Uh, this is not a pseudo obstruction because we have a clear mechanical cause um, and we've talked about the pseudo obstruction is when your imaging says there's no evidence of an obstruction, they just have all the features of it. A right hemicolectomy. So a right-sided colon cancer can be treated with laparotomy and a right hemi. Usually we do a primary anastomosis, um, even if they've caused an acute obstruction like we chatted about before. I'm repeating it because that's what helps us learn. <laughs> and um, in this setting, that is setting there's a lower risk of anastomotic leak, which is why that can be carried out. So just to show you, um, and it can be quite traumatic in these laparotomies, um, you've got to be very careful going in um, because the bowel can be sitting right below it. And when you suddenly relieve that pressure, it can sort of billow out. I mean, sometimes it's not that dramatic, but um, it can be quite impressive. So you can see on this photo, there's lots of dusky bits. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, maybe not. But um, the bits that look a bit gray, those are dead bits of bowel. And actually more important, when you are in that operation, there is nothing quite like the smell of dead bowel, I'll be honest. Uh, it's quite distinctive and it has, it will hang with you for a lot of the day until you get home and scrub yourself in the shower quite extensively. Um, so um, the complicated and obstruction are written there. I think there we've been through them a lot, so I'm not going to um, overwrite this point. Um, but uh, what I'm going to talk about a little bit more is uh, if you guys practically, if you are that first person at the scene, how are you going to treat it? So again, stay calm, don't panic. Um, think critical, non-critical. So I exclude bowel compromise as to whether or not you to get things going really, really quickly or whether you've got a bit more time to sit down, have a think and, and uh, correct uh, everything with a good resuscitation first. So I tend to structure treatments of anything into initial treatment and then into definitive treatment of which that can be either medical or conservative uh, or surgical. Um, so the treatment of bowel obstruction, first of all, exclude that there's dead bowel or there's a um, perforation. You do your ATE approach, correct the fluid and electrolytes um, if needed, and you're going to do your drip and suck. So by that, I mean, you need to put an NG tube in and you need to put a catheter in. Even if they're peeing fine, sometimes you'll get a like, oh no, they don't need a catheter, they can be fine. You need to be able to monitor that output to do your fluid and electrolytes correctly. Um, and uh, it's so you, you, they will need to put one in. If there are any signs of perforation, you may need to start them on the full septic six. So also have that in the back of your mind. Um, the NG tube, uh, if in a small bowel obstruction, they will almost certainly need. So sometimes you get a history where the vomiting stopped as you know, sort of a number of hours ago, um, and you, you're being asked whether or not they need to have one in. If they've had significant bilious vomiting, they will need it because even if they're not vomiting now, if that obstruction is complete and it hasn't resolved, they haven't yet opened their bowels or done things like that, then your, your small bowel can produce like nine liters of fluid a day. So they, they will be vomiting at some point and probably that will be a bleep for your night colleague at 2 a.m. to come put one in. Um, so the fluid shifts um, occur as the bowel swells and so it can't absorb things normally so then you get fluid sequestered in the lumen you may also get um, transitive fluid losses from the lumen into the peritoneal space um, and also remember if you've got ongoing vomiting this can lead to fluid loss with your potassium um, hydrogen ions sodium chloride so actually that's where you may then see a metabolic alkalosis on your picture with hypovolemia um, depending on whether or not the metabolic lactic acidosis we've talked about is the sort of ischemic uh, picture or if their hypovolemia is so severe they're now not perfusing other organs. In terms of, we talked a lot about large bowel um, obstruction management. In terms of small bowel obstruction, if there is bowel compromise or any suspicion of necrotic things on your CT scan, then they need to go for a resection. Otherwise, sometimes one of the management's employed is you give a solution called gastrographin and you do an x-ray um, at six hours and 12 hours and see if it's past the obstruction because it can be therapeutic in that it's hyper um, osmosis, so it drags lots of fluids into your gut and sometimes it can make people open the bowel. So 
it works quite well for adhesion on small bowel obstruction or sometimes I literally ask the patient because a lot of times I've had this before in the past have you had this before and they'll say oh yes you say well how was it treated was it surgery or a liquid and they were like oh no yeah I drank this thing and it worked wonderfully and I'm like perfect we'll probably try that again then um but also sometimes there's a consultant preferences so that's um for small bowel obstruction so on to uh, uh our penultimate question i think um an obese 34 year old man is day three after undergoing an emergency laparotomy for a pair of a perforated duodenal ulcer he complains of feeling really bloated and he's not opened his bowel since the operation Despite Oromorph and um, paracetamol, he says he hasn't really been able to mobilize because he's just, it's too painful. And prior to his operation, he was physically fit and well. He takes amitriptyline uh, for a previous diagnosis of depression, but otherwise no regular medications. On examination, his obs are all stable, but his abdomen is quite dense and you can't hear any bowel sounds. What is the most likely post-operative complication that's occurred? Ten seconds. Yeah, okay. Um, so yes, correct answer is paralytic ileus. Um, we've talked about classifying into mechanical or paralytic. Um, so his risk factors here, and well, what points towards it is your silent bowel sounds and the fact that he's post an operation where they may well have handled a lot of his bowels. Um, and as well, and on top of that, he's also obese um, and he's taking anticholinergic and opiate medications. Um, he's also not uh, mobilized postoperatively. So optimizing patients' pain post big laparotomy operations is crucial. There's one reason that if they, they have pain in their tummy, they won't breathe deeply. So if they breathe shallowly, they're a sitting duck for pneumonia or for atelectasis. Um, and secondly, it's so that I want them to move around because this will decrease the chance of them getting a paralytic ileus. If they're in lots of pain and they just lie still in bed all day, it's not surprising sometimes when they do develop an ileus. And uh, so sometimes I go around to patients and, you know, because you'll see they're not taking much pain medication, they sort of go, oh, no, no, I'm fine, if I just stay still. And I say to them, look, you know, some of this also patients do stoic in hospitals sometimes. Um, how much? Yes, I obviously am prescribing this because I don't want you to be in discomfort. There are also medical reasons. And then sometimes they kind of go, oh, yeah, OK, maybe. I mean, fine, fine, I'll take a, a little bit more than I, I wasn't quite a bit of pain. So going and chatting to your patient uh, can also help uh, to understand where their pain's at and help better treat that. Um, so you do expect, I guess the thing with paralytic ileus that can be confusing is to what extent is um, them not opening their bowels normal post an operation like this. So a degree of paralytic ileus post an operation like this is expected for about 24 to 48 hours physically, uh, physiologically after operating, but he's now day three. So he's past that and we should start thinking about pathological um, ileus. So the treatment for this is you make your patient ill by mouth. If they're vomiting profusely, then you may put a nasogastric tube in. Uh, you're gonna need um, fluid and electrolyte replacement. And if it's um, still persistent, you may need motility stimulants. Um, metoclopramide or erythromycin are good ones. Incidentally, metoclopramide, the reason why it's an antiemetic is because it's prokinetic. So in the acute obstructed situation, please don't prescribe this as an antiemetic. This is for post relieving an obstruction. Um, go with undone citron or something. So again, sort of things like antiemetics or laxatives don't always seem important when you're a medical student, but knowing these things well is very important. And it also will clarify if you rock up and see a dry chart with erythromycin on it and you're like, why are they on this antibiotic? Um, okay, so non-occlusive intestinal infarction. This can occur um, if the patient has had diminished mesenteric blood flow for a prolonged period of time. 
Um, it's usually a complication after, say, an MI or a bypass procedure. Um, so that's not the case here, but these are things to look out for if you ever have like a, um, a, uh, like a cardiothoracic job or something like that. Um, also, we've mentioned previously that infarcting the bowel can sometimes have a forceful bloody stool movement. Um, the other key symptom to look out for there is a new onset uh, fast atrial fibrillation. Uh, you'd expect in that situation the abdomen to be diffusely tender and very rigid because it's peritonitic from gangrene or perforation of that uh, infarctic segment. So it's not the picture here. Simple constipation. Um, so this can occur with reduced mobility and opiate medications, uh, particularly if their oral intake is decreased. So they also might not be opening their bowels because if they had obstruction for going on for a couple of days, they just hadn't eaten for a while as well. So it may take a while as well for things to get going. Uh, but a simple constipation is not a dynamic and the distension and the absence of the bowel sounds is what should alert you to a paralytic ileus. An adhesional obstruction. So this is the most common cause of small bowel obstruction, um, but it's a much later complication of surgery. So in, in day three, this is, uh, is too far on. Um, and uh, an intradominal abscess. Uh, it, so abscesses in themselves can cause ileus, um, but it, again, it's a bit later than day three. And he may also have features like septic shock, um, and this patient is well in afebrile. So talking about post-operative complications from these sort of operations, again, structure. So either you could think about maybe patient factors versus operative factors, um, operative factors. Um, I personally think about it as pre-operative, which are basically your patient factors, perioperative and post-operative um, factors that will predispose you towards complications. Um, so pre-operative, if someone's a smoker, they're older, they're overweight, um, maybe they're malnourished, particularly, or if they're a, an IBD patient, they may have deficiencies. Um, the tissue viability itself, if they've had radiotherapy to an area, it's not going to be as good. And their past medical history, sickle cell disease, vascular disease, etc. Um, these are going to put you at risk for post-operative complications. Perioperative factors. Clean or contaminated, if there's like frank fecal peritonitis or maybe just some turbulent fluid, those are two very different operations. Your surgical technique. So if you're worried about getting a wound dehiscence post-operatively, um, th this will have an impact. Um, we close the abdomen with something called Jenkins rule, um, which is where you want a suture that's four times the length of your wound and you take one centimeter bites, one centimeter from the edge and one centimeter apart. Um, whether or not it was an emergency is a big, is a big risk factor. Um, and whether it, it lasted more than two hours, if they were septic at the time, they needed transfusions, the duration of bowel handling, all of these things. So reading the op note can be really helpful towards thinking about how worried am I about this patient who's saying they've got a bit of tummy pain. If you read it was a horrendous operation, then take that seriously, even if it may not seem that bad. Um, Post-operative factors, if they've got an infection, whether that be pneumonia, UTI, surgical site infection, et cetera. Electrolyte imbalances, whether or not their pain has been well controlled. Um, uh, for example, also mobility will decrease your risk of DVTs or PEs. So you need to get your patient up and moving around for that reason. Um, and uh, certain medications as well. Uh, so then in terms of your actual complications, I think about them structured by time. So you have your immediate post-operative complications, so maybe um, even malignant hypothermia from an anaesthetic gas, um, you can get atelectasis very early on, um, uh, reactions or anaphylaxis to any medications, um, a normal physiological temperature post-op, so those are in the sort of hours period after your operation. Then I have early um, uh, complications, which would be naught to three days, so for this you're thinking more about um, either DVT or PE. There is also a post-op MI period as highest in this first 72 hours. So if someone's with SV gastric pain and they've got a lot of heart history, think about it. It might not be indigestion. You know, they might be having an MI. It's very simple to do an ECG and a TROP. Um, or yes, you then have all your infective ones that could be from any number of sources that you're going to work up. And then you have your later ones. So for me, that would be your an asthmatic leak, your abscesses, um, and then much more delayed are things like fistulas, or if you were doing orthopedics or something, any or a mesh that's been put in an abdomen, abdominal surgery, maybe an infection of that later on. Um, so again, just find a way to structure them. Um, otherwise, they can be a bit overwhelming. <laughs>
So on to our final case. We now have a two-year-old boy and he's presented to you with abdominal pain, bilious vomiting and rectal bleeding. On examination, his abdomen appears distended and is tender to palpation. It's worse in the midline and the right iliac fossa. And an abdominal ultrasound shows a small fluid-filled pouch off the distal small intestine. What's the most likely diagnosis? Ten seconds. Yeah, the the correct um, answer is indeed Meckel's diverticulum. Um, and this one has a common um, adage to remember it by as the rule of twos. So a Meckel's diverticulum is the most common congenital gastrointestinal abnormality, and it's due to a remnant of the vitellointestinal duct of the embryo. It's usually on the anti-mesenteric border, I've got a photo in a second, of the ileum, um, and is a true diverticulum. And by that, I mean it contains all three layers out pouch rather than just like one, one of the outside ones. The rule of twos, is that it has a male to female ratio of two to one. It's approximately two inches in length, is two feet proximal to the cecum, and occurs in approximately 2% of the population. It usually presents in infants and toddlers, or two-year-olds, um, and not in the neonatal period. This, uh, there may also be a history of painless rectal bleeding, um, as like we've said, if you get an ulceration of adjacent tissue, um, that can be from the diverticulum containing ectopic gastric tissue and that produces acid. Um, if the pain is due to the diverticulum inflammation, it can actually mimic appendicitis. So it's a key thing to remember as differentials in a, in a child with right iliac fossa pain. And actually, if you're in an appendicectomy and you get in there and the appendix turns out to be normal, the next thing you do is it's called running the small bowel. So you very gently with your instruments run the whole length of the small bowel to be able to check there is not a Meckel's diverticulum. Um, the investigation um, is what's shown here. So sometimes um, an inflamed or obstructive Meckel's can show a fluid filled pouch and ultrasound, not all the time. Um, and an X-ray may have very non-specific features of obstruction. In this acute setting, the treatment would be a nasogastric tube for decompression and then resection of the diverticulum. So Hirschsprung's disease. This um, commonly presents in the neonatal period as a failure to pass meconium in the first 48 hours of life. Um, it's a congenital condition of aganglionic distal bowel, and it's usually the rectum, and it causes distension proximal to that segment that's not working. There may be features of obstruction like bilious or feculent vomiting and abdominal distension, and if Hirschman's related um, enterocolitis is suspected, that's the emergency that requires rectal decompression. It's the RET proto-oncogene proto that's commonly implicated with this disease, um, but its pathology is not fully understood. You, on a rectal biopsy, uh, that will give you the diagnosis if there's an absence of the ganglionic cells, unlike in an acquired megacolon. Conservative treatment uh, is with regular enemas, um, whilst uh, neonatal surgical treatment is with an, illicit, uh, an initial colostomy um, and uh, it, for the acute emergency obstruction. And then later you're going to do a resection of the affected segment with an anastomosis between the normal colon and your anal canal. Bile gastroenteritis, this would present with vomiting or diarrhea. And again, we've got to think of medical differentials as, um, in kids, the same as adults. Um, your stools might be watery, but obstruction as here would not be a feature. You may you know, ask about other family members being ill. And also now in these pandemic times, you do need to think of COVID-19 when you see people with vomiting and diarrhea. Um, having worked in A&E in the first peak and ward cover for the second one, I've seen a number of people present, I think it's like, 10% can present and it looks like a norovirus. It's just profuse uh, vomiting and diarrhea. And whilst the child himself may be relatively well, uh, I mean, I know there is now a vaccine, but they may well um, be exposing uh, this to 
uh, vulnerable groups like elderly grandparents. Meconium ileus. Uh, so this is a neonatal diagnosis and wouldn't present at this age. 80% uh, have cystic fibrosis and may have additional features usually alongside it like failure to thrive. Um, X-rays show a distended bowel and a, a, it's called a ground glass appearance of a very viscous meconium. And your treatment in the first instance is trying to clear the blockage with gastrographin, which as we talked about before is a hyperosmolar agent and will draw fluid into the lumen. Intersusception. Um, so this is uh, what you'd like to think about in young infants or toddlers with screaming attacks, or sometimes they'll be drawing their legs up because they can't tell you they have tummy pain. You have to look at the child and see what they're doing. Um, and it occurs when one portion of bowel prolapses into the lumen of the adjacent bowel, and then you create this like telescoping appearance um, as opposed to a small fluid filled pouch. It may present with a red current jelly stools is the classic one for in terms of exam questions and a sausage shaped mass on examination. You may also get a history of being unwell, like a sort of vague cold virally sort of thing for one to three days prior to that presentation. Um, it's most common in slightly younger children uh, than this patient here. So three months to 12 month olds would be the most common. Um, and if the child is relatively well, the way we treat it is with a pneumatic reduction under fluoroscopic guidance. Um, but if the child is unwell or you suspect a perforation, laparotomy is your treatment of choice. Um, so finally, to sum up, um, pediatric causes. I'm not going into these in a huge amount of detail because I believe there are two separate um, QuestMed talks on pediatric um, uh, pathologies. So uh, this was just to put a few relevant surgical ones in. Um, so um, I have further subdivided them into neonatal ones and infants um, as my way of structuring this. It's not a fully comprehensive list, um, but it was just to emphasize that the age will affect your differential. It, it is particularly pertinent in a child. You will also need to ask um, to, in your history of presenting complaints, um, details about the woman's pregnancy and her birth details. You know, was it a C-section? Was it a vaginal birth? Were they premature? Because that could be a risk factor uh, for a number of things. Um, and um, uh, it's just taking that slightly broader history. Have they been immunized, um, et cetera? Um, so thank you for listening. I, I know that one uh, went on a little bit longer than planned. Um, but does anybody have any questions? Thank you so much, Marie. That was really awesome. I learned loads. So I hope everybody else listening did too. There are a number of questions in the Q&A box. Okay. So, um, but just before we start on them, just a final reminder to everybody to please fill out the feedback form because it is really important to all of us. Um, so anything that you would like to see done differently or to be improved, or if you just want to say thanks to Marie for running such a great session, all of that is appreciated. And I have put the link in the chat. If you're not on the site, then you can, if you're already on the site, you just scroll down and it's below the video. Um, would you like me to read out the questions or can you see um, them? Actually, right? I can see them. Um, okay. uh, shall I select a couple? Because there's a number and I'm not sure I have time for every one of them. I'm very sorry. If you guys, yeah, still, sure. if you guys still have questions, I'm sure if you email them to them, they'd be happy to answer them. I'm just aware that I've uh, taken up a lot of your evening as it is. And there's also Study Hub uses Student Q. So if you've got questions that haven't been answered, there's a link on the Study Hub site. You can pop them in there and somebody will answer them. Okay, um, so for the, per for the person that asked what exactly does drip and suck involve, it's just a kind of um, fun surgical adage to say uh, you're going to drip one end, so that's your nasogastric tube that goes down into the stomach. Note, uh, if you ask a nurse for a nasogastric tube, if they're surgical nurses are usually very good, but just check what they've given you is not uh, yellow, because that is a feeding tube, and if you feed into an obstruction, that's disaster. Uh, what you want is a Riles tube. So it'll just look like a clear tube and you thread it down and you kind of size it going from here to here to your ziffy sternum at five centimeters below, 90 degrees back, keep pushing. You'll probably do one in a clinical skills station at some point. And then um, the suck is the catheter. That, so you can basically measure both input and output. And that's the reason why you need it. Um, so you can treat appropriately with fluids, electrolytes, etc. cetera. Um, Is it possible to get absent? But 
So, yeah, so that someone asked, is it possible to get absent bowel sounds in a mechanical bowel obstruction? So what I've said is what you will read in lots of finals questions where the absence of bowel sounds is ileus and tinkling bowel sounds is your mechanical obstruction. Um, the honest truth is that obviously medicine uh, patients don't always abide by these lovely rules that we have set them. So sometimes, yes, you can get not particularly tinkling bowel sounds um, or rather quiet ones um, on obstruction and sometimes in paralytic ileus I can hear some bowel sounds that are just really silent and clinically this is an ileus to me. Um, so uh, that's the one for that one. Uh, there's somebody who asked what the vitamin sieve is. Um, you can, well, to be honest, you can look that one up online but let me just see if I can flip back to what it is. Um, so, I mean, off the top of my head, because um, I had this one written down, it's not typically a sieve I always use, but it's a uh, vascular, um, idiopathic, um, uh, I think it's toxins, autoimmune, um, metabolic, um, idiopathic, um, iatrogenic and um, neoplasm. Uh, but either the, the talk will go up on YouTube or you can just Google that one if you come up with it. Sometimes people also have slightly different nuances of vitamin. Um, epigastric, is this the same as a hiatus hernia? Okay, it's a good question. That can get quite confusing. Um, so epigastric hernia uh, is one that is occurring and it's outpouching through um, the, the top portion of your stomach. So just here. So it's in your epigastric region and it's typically in the midline and you will see a little lump. Um, it might just be fat, it might not contain bowel, but it can contain bowel. A hiatus hernia is one where your stomach, if you have the diaphragm and you usually have the esophagus come through in your stomach, it can slide up or it can kind of roll and pouch up. So that's not something you will see or be able to feel. It's internal. And more to the point, there's not a lot that needs doing for that. You might put someone on a PPI for that if they're getting symptoms, but otherwise most people may well have one and never know about it and never give them any problems. Whereas an epigastric hernia is quite a high risk of strangulating. Um, so those are the two differences. Um, so I got told you rarely do abdominal x-rays because you can get a CT quite easily and it's more helpful. So um, yes and no. X-rays, um, particularly if you've got an efficient um, A&E, are very quick and easy to get. And if you remember, you've got to think about your patient. So to get through a CT with contrast is about five minutes. If you've got a really demented old lady who's agitated and kicking off, she's not going to sit still for it you might well be able to get an x-ray from her and it is good on young people to try and do an x-ray first if they're if they are a current patient they're going to have potentially multiple cts throughout their life and you're going to irradiate their ovaries so it's a little bit of consideration or sometimes you can't do a ct because they've got end-stage renal disease or they're so dehydrated that creatinine's off the charts and you're not able to give them contrast right now either so it's good to help stratify for the purposes of exams, if someone is unstable, never send them to CT. I think the adage is donut of death. Um, yes, on your clinical placement, placements, I will be honest. If the person is stably unstable, if that makes sense, there is a good chance you will see them just get put straight in the CT scanner because it does give us a lot of information. But for the purposes of SBAs, answer it this way, it's the driving test way. Okay, but I agree there may be some discrepancy on what you see on placements. Uh, what is a pseudo obstruction? So that is an obstruction where you have all the clinical features, but when you do your imaging, your CT, your x-ray, whatever, there is no evidence of any obstruction, usually metabolic abnormalities or maybe a spinal fracture. When would you request a magnesium in your blood test? If I think someone's got a bowel obstruction or if their potassium's low, I will add on a magnesium. Any bowel obstruction patients, I always add on a magnesium. Um, and note, if you're trying to increase someone's potassium and you've given them loads of 40 millimoles in a bag and it's just not coming up, it's probably because you haven't checked their magnesium. So the potassium doesn't usually correct all that easily until you correct the magnesium. Um, so, Without a perforation, how else can you get peritonitis in a bowel obstruction? Uh, so if it's died and it started to go gangrenous, 
um, how do you normally treat a volvulus? So you can do that with um, a flatus tube and decompression if they're well. Um, how long does it take for gastrographin to work? So you usually give it at least 12 to 24 hours to work. So you do your x-rays at six hours and 12 hours because you would expect it to have passed through the gut in this time. And if your 12 hour x-ray shows this contrast just sitting in the stomach and absolutely nothing has gone through the gut, that's a good indication this conservative management is probably not gonna work. They are heading for an operation. Whereas if at your 12 hour x-ray actually some is starting to pass through, you sort of sit and cross your fingers and you think maybe we can get away without an operation here. How do you manage a pneumoperitoneum? Well, so pneumoperitoneum, if it's pathological, i.e. it's not like we're, we're doing laparoscopic surgery or something, it just implies something's perforated. So that's an emergency laparotomy and sorting out whatever the perforation is. If it's a duodenal uh, perforation, maybe it's an mental patch or something like this. If it's um, a small bowel obstruction that's perforated, you may need to do a resection, etc. Just treat whatever's perforated and the scan can help tell you that, or you may find it in surgery. Um, how long does it take to have a bowel moved after surgery? How long is a piece of string? Um, what you need to take into account is the factors. So if you've got a really frail old lady who's had an obstruction building up for several days, she probably looks like the type two that doesn't really eat much anyway because she has a sort of tea and toast diet. She hasn't eaten anything because she's been feeling so sick for three days. And then she has this big operation. Give her a bit of time. It's, you know, I, there may not be that much poo in her. Um, but if you're starting to get day three and above and day th and also it's the patient, you know, if it's day three and they haven't passed the stool, but they're like, oh, I feel fine. They're completely soft, non-tender. I'm not that worried if they're day three, but actually they're distended. They're like, this really hurts. Then I'm more worried. So it's also your clinical examination. Um, to, you can't really put a time limit on what's normal for a bowel limit, a bowel movement after surgery. Um, what are your tips for entering CST? Um, I think that's probably a separate talk in itself that if QuesMed wants me to give, I'm happy to, but um, I'm conscious that they're more about med medical education. I don't want to step on their toes there. Um, how's gastrographin given if someone's vomiting profusely? So yeah, so what you hopefully have done by the time you give the gastrographin is you put in the nasogastric tube and you've decompressed. Sometimes that requires aspiration rather than just free drainage for a little bit. Um, so someone's like really, really vomiting, you put the NG in, you get all this fluid out, you may well need to aspirate, you know, a, a couple of liters off before they'll then settle. Once they're, they've got a safely sighted NG, then you can put the gastrographin in and you can put it in through that NG. It's sort of, it's not feeding, just so you know it's got right down into the stomach rather than like you say, they vomit it back up. Sometimes they do vomit it back up. It's not, um, it's not completely foolproof. This is where sometimes there's, different schools of thought so ask your bosses because i'm not fully decided on which is the right way but there's different schools of thought as to when you do the gastrographin so some people say do it immediately because the sooner it's given the sooner it's, it's more likely to work and i can see the logic behind that some people say if it's out of hours don't give it wait till it's in hours because there's a slight safety issue where if they aspirate it you have a chemical mediastinitis on your hands which is a disaster and that is a lot more easy to manage in daylight hours when there's lots of people around. But others prefer to speak on whether or not it's 3 a.m. or 3 p.m. So I, that's one to ask on your placements. Um, and um, I think it's eight o'clock. So should we, uh, should we leave it there? Um, Great. Room. Yeah, that's fine. So thank you so much. And well done to the people who are still here um and uh yeah do remember to fill in the feedback if you haven't already and also you can follow study hub on social media to or on instagram and facebook and maybe that's it what else is there <laughs> so instagram and facebook anyway um uh, and to find out about future events and things like that and check out the site as well but thank you very much again to Dr. Marie Edson, um, you look like you deserve a nice <laughs> evening off now. So yeah, sorry about the race. I've like spent all day in theatre and haven't eaten or drank. So. <laughs> yeah. Go and have some food and a drink. And uh, and thanks so much for coming.